You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for surrounding us, even when we don't know it. Thank you for walking before us and behind us. That in spite of us, you choose to know us. You choose to understand us. Father, I pray that the, the love that you have for us rubs off on us, that we might love ourselves with the same passion. That we would see ourselves through your eyes. Beautifully broken masterpieces. Father, let this word be glorifying to your name. Lord, I pray to use these words, not mine, but yours, to bring glory to your kingdom. Father, I ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Go ahead, give your neighbor a high five, give him a hug, give him an elbow bump, smack him on the way down. Unless you're holding a baby, don't touch the ones with the babies. Amen. Amen. Was, was the coffee strong this morning? Because I feel like you all got a little bit rowdier during worship than you normally do. See, it's that, that Holy Spirit caffeine just kind of kicked in on some of you guys. I love you too, baby. That's what she was really saying, right? Is that the, the Chinese heart thing? Is that how it goes? Psalm 139, verses 1 through 8. And so uh, in preparation for this, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I usually try to come up with an introduction. I, I love telling stories, personal stories, because I feel like it helps me relate to the Scripture. And I, I'm hoping that on some level that you can relate to the Scriptures through my story to better understand what God is speaking. I'm not going to lie. I set up this morning, and I'm going over my notes. And I'm just I'm writing stuff down. And one thing kept popping in my mind, and it kind of became a theme throughout the message, okay? So uh, are you guys familiar with Brian McKnight? Yeah. Two people. Okay, it's going to be a lot more interesting than I thought. There's this song. Uh, it's a beautiful song. It's one of my favorite songs, actually. It's called uh, Start Back at One. Are you guys familiar with it? Yeah. I can't sing. I promise you I, I would. Can, can you just like. If you know, I know you know it. Sing it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, four, right? Repeat steps one through three. I usually have three points in every message. It's, it's a way of structuring my message so that, that we can take notes and, and better grasp what God is trying to speak. And today God gave me four. So I have four. So this is a little bit off, okay? I know this is, this is a change. Not many people deal well with change. But follow me. I promise you it's going to be worth it. Amen. And so we're going to do steps. Steps one, two, three, four. And as we go, if you feel led to sing, a bribe night, just belt it out. Let's go, let's do it together. Amen. But uh, in, in all honesty, as, I'm, as I was uh, preparing for this message, the, the word intimacy is a word that kept coming up. And the, the whole series, the premise of this, this four week series is all I want for Christmas is blank, blank, blank. Today's fill in blank is love. All I want for Christmas is love. And the reason I chose that in this scripture specifically is because every single one of us is designed to, to want, to need intimacy. We crave intimacy. 
And unfortunately, because most of us, a lot of us at a young age, have a, a distorted view or distorted understanding of what that intimacy is, we, we, we ultimately end up looking at God differently than he should be looked at. He created us so that we would crave intimacy with him. But that word intimacy scares a lot of us. Can we be real? Like a lot of people like hear intimacy and they're like, no, like I, I'm okay with just being acquaintances. Like there's a reason social media is so popular. You wanna know why? Because we're allowed to put ourselves out there as much as we want to. You get to see what I wanna show you. You get to hear the thoughts I wanna share and we can be friends. As long as you like my post, friends. <laughs> And, and that, that's our, our, our idea of intimacy is, is what we're willing to share. But intimacy was meant to be something that's completely vulnerable. And, and that's where a lot of us get terrified. And it's ultimately why a lot of us go down paths we never want to go down and experience toxic relationships and, and things along those lines. Because we're craving something and we're going to the wrong sources for the, for the satisfaction. Amen? And so there's four types of intimacy that David specifically talks about in these eight verses that we just read, okay? So we're gonna go through each form of intimacy, and this is how it works. Each, each step builds on the next one. And so you can't have the second one without first going through the first, which is intellectual intimacy. Intellectual intimacy. I, I, I wrote this down because it, it, everything else compounds on this basic idea of sharing our innermost thoughts. If you read the text again, he says, you have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You see and you understand my thoughts from afar. Every true form of intimacy starts by sharing our innermost thoughts. And I can make you reflect, if you're married or if you're dating somebody, do you remember how it all started? Hi, my name's Anthony. What's your favorite color? What, right? right? Is that how it usually starts? Like we start off like low key, like, so what, what's your favorite food? If you could have one thing for Christmas, what would it be? And it magically shows up on the doorstep. We, we, we learn about one another by asking questions, by having conversations. And the more that we share about ourselves and the more that we, we discover about the other person, it develops a, a form of intimacy. This is intellectual. You don't even have to meet the person to develop a form of intimacy just by communication. That's why words are so powerful. It's also why we should be careful about who we share our innermost thoughts with. Not everybody is meant to go intimately with you into your innermost thoughts. And a lot of times we get caught up in, in things outside of what God wants for us and we'll share things which later come back to hurt us. And so we wonder why we're, we're timid when it comes to relationships. We wonder why we're scared of intimacy. You see, what I'm talking about right now is human intimacy. Your spouse, your friends, your family members. But in this text, David's not talking about one of his wives. He's not talking about any of his children. He's talking about God. He's saying, God, you see me. You hear me. You know my innermost thoughts. And it's funny because I look at David, and, and the more I reflect on the, the Bible and these men and women throughout it as humans, because we kind of take that away from them, don't we? We take the humanity out of Scripture. We stop seeing them as actual men and women who had issues. You know what I discovered? David has intimacy issues. Think about it, because throughout the scriptures, like he's continually making mistakes, but all he's looking for is some form of intimacy. So, and, and, and it, it, again, it goes back. It goes back to our childhood most of the time. We see when, when all of his brothers were called before the prophet, and he was going to announce who would uh, follow King Saul as the king of Israel. And, and he doesn't even call David. He leaves him out in the fields. He calls all of his older, better-looking brothers. And one after another, they're, they're dismissed and dismissed. And he asks, is that all the sons you have? Well, there's David. Do you understand? He, he didn't have that intimacy with his father. And so you start to understand why he would crave intimacy with Bathsheba. Because he was looking to fulfill something that was missing deep inside. And so he understood that the, the king of the universe, God himself, is the source of our intimacy. But like all of us, we get caught up in trying to find a faster way. 
We all want the five minute abs. We all want the, the five minutes, the, the three steps to healing. No, it, it's, it's a process of learning about God to discover what true intimacy is meant to be. And so I think David is speaking from a place of wisdom now. It, it, it's funny, the text that we read a few weeks ago, we, we talked about how, how David's son was trying to kill him. And David's best friend comes along and says, you need to get your stuff together. Because the people who love you, you hate. And the people that hate you, you love. And this is starting to reflect on people. People are seeing this. You need to get your stuff together. And he calls them out on it. But you have to understand that David had a, a lack of something that he was created to have. And so we read this text and we understand this, this, this dysfunction that David had and how he finally came to the conclusion that there is no other source you see, where we try to hide things in our hearts and we, we're afraid to share things about ourselves, God already knows. There, there, there is no barriers. There's nothing blocking us from him. He sees all. He knows all. He's all-powerful. He, he knows every intimate detail, every thought that you thought about thinking. I just went three steps deeper than you can possibly catch up with. He knows what you're thinking before you think that you're going to think it. That, that's how, that's how, how, how much he sees into us. And so it, once we understand this, that there's nothing hindering him from seeing all, it gives us a freedom to share all. You see, most of the time it's funny because a lot of us, we, we, we try to hide things, right? And I've preached this, we try to hide from God. And I realize we're not trying to hide from God. Because once you've been in church long enough and you've had an understanding of how he sees and how he knows, you should understand you cannot hide anything from God. So who are we hiding from? Those things that you're ashamed of, those things that have hurt you, that you tried to, you tried to hide, the things in the back of your closet you tried to bury, we, we know we can't hide them from God. So who are we really trying to hide it from? If I had a mirror, I'd show you. We're, we're trying to hide ourselves from it. Because the pain of our past and the pain of our, our past hurts and our, our shame and our, our embarrassment, the mistakes that we've made, we're terrified of them. Because we think in some way they define us. And so I don't think a lot of us have a problem understanding that God sees through all that. I think we have a hard time seeing God through all of that. It's hard for us to see the Father through all the things that we try to hide from our own sight. And so it's not until we open up and actually start to share our hearts and share our innermost thoughts with the Father that we understand how we can do this with one another. You see, uh, this whole text is about the relationship between David and the Father. And he is speaking about God and how God sees him. I want you to understand that every relationship that you will ever have flows from that point. So you cannot have a healthy marriage if you don't have a healthy relationship with God. They go hand in hand. You, you cannot understand how to possibly love and show grace and mercy to your children and have patience because they do some stuff that just drives you up a wall. And I'm not even saying they don't. I'm just saying that, that, that if you want to be able to handle it, good luck, you two. If you want to be able to handle it, good luck. So, what, but without this, without understanding the Father and how he sees us, every relationship, everything else that we look at in our lives will always fall off. It will never work properly if we don't have the proper alignment. And so point one, write this down, the first step so true intimacy is intellectual intimacy. Asking the questions to help understand who we're speaking to. And I, I, I started thinking about this. I, one of the things I, I love when people tell me like, you know, I, just, I, want, I want to be used by God. I want to see miracles. I want, I, want, I, want, I want the physical embodiment of Jesus right in front of me. Okay, tell me how much you talk to him. What do you mean? How much do you pray to him? Well, I drive, I, when I'm driving, I talk to them. Oh, you mean with your coffee in one hand, your cell phone in the other hand, pray, what are you praying that you get to work without dying? Is that, that doesn't constitute the kind of intellectual intimacy I'm talking about. I'm talking about being intentional about our time with him. As in setting aside time to speak to him. More importantly, to be quiet and to hear from him. That is intimacy. And I can tell you right now, this again flows down in your marriage. If you're not being intentional about your marriage, you'll lose intimacy. If you're not asking questions, never stop studying your spouse. Never stop studying. Never stop studying your children. Never stop asking questions. 
Because we're all changing constantly. I love when you hear about husbands and wives like down the road, like, well, we just kind of, we kind of fell apart. We kind of, we kind of moved apart. No, that wasn't like, a, that wasn't a fast, oh, you turned a corner, now you're in two different streets. No, you guys stopped chasing each other. You stopped asking the questions. Guess what? When I was 24, my favorite color was blue. Right now, guess what my favorite color is? Black. It is. I love black. There's nothing wrong with that. Stop judging me. But, but things change. Things change. Your, your, your physical body, your taste changes. What, every seven years? Every seven years, your body literally changes how it feels about food. And so if you're married 24, 30, 60 years, like you've been through six different lifetimes of changes. And so if you stop asking questions, the intimacy will fall away. And that's just step one. Let's get to step two. Let's go to step two. This is emotional intimacy. You see, because the more you ask questions, the more you get to know the person you're talking to. For David, the more he spent time with God, the more that he spoke to God, the more that he shared his innermost thoughts, the more emotional he became with him. He became emotionally connected. This is how, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is how a lot of uh, uh, adultery, can I say that word? This is how a lot of adultery happens in marriages. Because you start having a conversation with somebody outside of your spouse, and you start sharing things you really shouldn't be sharing. And what happens? An emotional attachment starts to bond. And so that's why we have to constantly be on guard and be aware of who we're supposed to be sharing these things with. There's nothing wrong with sharing our inner thoughts with friends and family, but you have to be wise about who you're sharing these things with. And so for David, he, this, I love this verse, says, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Everything that we speak flows from the heart. Every single thing that, that we utter off our lips, good or bad, flows from our heart. More importantly, the condition of your heart. What are you ingesting and what are you taking in? It will produce what comes out. And so David is saying, before I even utter a syllable, you already know my heart. That means that he is so in tune with him, so intimate with him intellectually, that God knows every action that he will take in addition to every thought or word that he will speak. And this sounds like a fairy tale when it comes to earthly relationships. How could we ever be so close to somebody, emotionally speaking, that I would know what they're thinking before they even say a word. And I can tell you firsthand, it is possible. Yes? I do it all the time to her. We'll be driving, like, what are you thinking right now? What do you think I'm thinking? I think you're thinking this. How do you know that? Because I know you. I, it's the same thing with God. We, well, God, how do you feel about this? If you are in his word enough, if you are talking to him enough, you will know how God feels about something. And you can stop asking every single person, hoping that somebody will give you an answer that you like. Because nobody else's opinion matters when it comes to the Word of God. It, it, the Word of God stands in and of itself. And so the more that we talk to Him, the more that we get to know who He is, the more we, we fall in love. The more we develop an emotional bond to God. I love how this is step two, the emotional side of it. Because emotions can sway and emotions can change. But the more you get to know somebody, the, the more our heart goes out to them. And so for David, he's saying, like, you, you know me. You know, you, not, you know when I'm getting up and when I'm lying down. You know every detail about the actions I'm going to take for the day. The external stuff. You know all the external stuff. And then he goes to the next step. But even the internal things, the things that flow from our heart before it's even presented to the world, you know it. Before a word comes off my lips, you know my heart. Tell me that doesn't terrify some of you. That you don't even have to speak a word and God can look at your heart and know exactly what you're about to say. It should terrify us. Because that, that tells us that, that, that we're being vulnerable with him. He was aware of it and he shares this. And it's the same thing when it comes to every relationship we'll ever have outside the paradigm of God. That the, the emotional attachment, that emotional intimacy that we all crave... And I know some of you, because I've been through this enough, so I don't need emotional connections. Stop lying. The more you tell me you don't need an emotional connection, the more you're really saying, hug me. <laughs> that, isn't it? That's, think about it. Like, the more people try to act tough, like, yeah, I'm a big, tough guy. That, no, that tells me you're a little puppy. Like, you just want to be hugged. 
well, I don't need emotional connections. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man. No, you, you know what you're telling me? That when nobody's looking, you cry at the notebook. That's what that tells me. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. What I'm saying is that, is that the more we try to put out this facade that we don't need this, guess what? We were designed to crave emotional intimacy. We, we were designed to, to need it, to, to want it, to, to consume us because he's meant to be the source. Now, now hear me. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with experiencing emotional intimacy with your spouse and with your children and with friends. And, and these things are all beautiful, but they all flow from the same point. And David is saying, you know me, you know my heart, and I can look at you and tell you that you are meant to have the same relationship with the people that God puts in your life. That you should be able to look at your spouse, to look at your children, to look at your friends and be able to, to say like you, you know me and I know you. Now, it'll never be as intimate as God because God's all-knowing. But the, we are meant to crave this from one another. And if we're not going to the correct source, we'll go down avenues and roads that he does not want us going down. And so know this for step two. Emotional intimacy is so important. And it starts by sharing our innermost thoughts with God. Amen? You ready for point three? Yep. Step three. This is experiential intimacy. If we were to look at this as a, a man and a woman courting one another, step one is the late night conversations. You know, the two o'clock conversations where you're not really saying anything at all. You're, you, you hang up. No, you hang up. I love you. I love you. I love you too. That's the intellectual intimacy. It's creating a connection intellectually without even having to be in the same room as the other person. And the more we do this, our emotional connections. That's when you're not talking to them, but they consume your every single thought. You're at work and you're just humming, Ma Linda, Ma Linda. It, it, it consumes, it, con it consumes you. Not in a bad way. It's, 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 it's such an emotional high. It's a, it's a connection that God has ordained and designed for you. And so when you find yourself talking to them constantly, that's step one. When you find yourself thinking about them, just wanting to be near them, just wanting to hear their voice, that's step two. And step three is the dating. It's experiencing life with the other person. You see, now if we, we, if we go back to God in this equation, it's our prayer life. It's how we talk to God, how we hear from God. It's creating this, this bond that 45 minutes in the Word is not enough. You will find yourself like just looking to hear podcasts and looking to hear sermons and, and just wanting to hear the Word of God, and it's never enough. And you're listening to worship, and it's like, it's like the person that you love is right there, but you can't hold them. That's that step two, that emotional intimacy with God. And step three is experiencing life, knowing that he is around us. Experiencing life with him as our lens. That is experiential intimacy. You know, you look at a lot of couples when they're in their 60s and 70s, been married 50 years, and they start to tell you all the things that they've done together. And the little inside jokes, the things that make no sense to anybody else. But every little experience from the first baby's cry to the last diaper that was changed to the, the vacations. And, and if you're around my family, my, the Gattuso family, there are so many stories. And I'm not going to share them because they're, they're right there. But, but they talk to them, ask them. I, I love hearing stories, like to hear spouses talk about one another, things that they experience. I'll give you even a little tip. Ask them about the, was it the pylone? Is that what it's called, right? The bowl? No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just saying, go talk to them and ask them about it. And you're going to see this, this, this light light up inside them because it's such a core part. It's an experience that they had. And if you look at the relationships around you, isn't it defined by the experiences that we share? I, 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 I look at our marriage and it's, it's about the, the children and the first time buying a home and the first time moving and the second child and the, the, the churches that we started and pastoring and, and all these experiences come together to form a beautiful relationship. And this is what David says about it. He says, you hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. 
such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. He, he's saying that you are so embedded in my everyday life, I can't even comprehend that you're around me like this, that you're in me and around me and before me and behind me. I can't even grasp how great you are, that you can be in all these places at once and love me so much that you would dwell within me. This is what David is saying. He goes, you, you, you have literally binded me. You've surrounded me. I can't even comprehend it. And, and it's funny because we are meant to feel the same thing. Everybody's terrified of the world. Well, the world's going to end. Who cares? Who cares? I'm not trying to be mean. Like, I want everybody to get saved, but we shouldn't fear the end of the world because it's just the end of a season. It's like literally you getting fired from your job. Did it destroy you? I know some of y'all's personalities. I know you got fired at some point in your life. Yes? Has one person been fired here? Praise God. Okay? It, but do you understand that it didn't end? It was just the start of a new season. This world coming to an end in darkness and all these things that everybody's so terrified of. Guess what? We shouldn't be. Because God is before us, behind us, around us, in us. There, there's no place that we can look where he's not there. And so that should bring us peace that we can, we can be surrounded by him. That he is so intimate with us, that he engulfs us in his love. That we can't escape it, and some of us try. And we will run away because his love terrifies us. And we will flee because it intimidates us. And we are scared of it because it's so uncomprehensible. Like, it's, it's the magnitude of his love. It says that if his love was real, it could crush us. If it, if it was a weight in this world, it would crush us to be in the presence of his love for us. And all of that trickles down into our daily relationships and how you're meant to love and, and be around. I, 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 can't, I can't understand why I, I, I meet people and they're like, oh yeah, I saw my wife three weeks ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, I haven't seen my kids. And they're little. I haven't seen my kids in like three months. And, and I'm like, I would go nuts. I would. I call her five minutes after I leave the house. But like, hey, baby, what are you doing? I miss you. And I, I don't say that to boast. I'm telling you, it's because we have prioritized God in our life. That my time with him structures and forms everything else. It forms our marriage. It forms our parenting. It forms our finances. It forms how we love. It forms how we forgive. It forms everything. That's intimacy. And here's the, the last step. You ready for this? spiritual intimacy. This is the most difficult one to explain. In all honesty, it's, there are no words that I can say or speak to do justice to what spiritual intimacy looks like. I remember before I was saved, I would go to church and I would hear people talk. And they had this excitement and this joy. And I remember thinking like, I, I, I don't get it. Like they have like this light and they're, they're happy. I, I, don't, I couldn't comprehend it. I remember thinking like, can you just explain it to me? Like, do I just make a decision and then I get that? Do I, do I go to church every single Sunday and give money and then I get it? Like, what do I have to do to experience what you have? And every single person I asked, you want to know what they told me? You have to experience it. I'm trying to. Can you help me, help a brother out? Can you just point me in the right direction? And this is what they tell me. You, you have to get to know him. You, step, you could, we cannot jump to step four and think that we're going to have spiritual maturity to understand the intimacy that he is offering us if we're not willing to first talk to him, to, to, to develop an emotional attachment to him and intimacy with him, or that we're not looking to experience life with him. You cannot have spiritual intimacy. That, that is the place where the hell can come, fire can come, everything can fall apart, but yet you still have a joy. That you can still have a peace. That's spiritual intimacy. It, it, it cannot be spoken about in words. It can only be experienced. And so this is my, my, my point, this entire message is if, if you, and we, we put compartments in our lives. If your marriage is struggling, and you're not talking, start at step one. If you talk and you share and you have an emotional connection, but you're always dividing, you're always going places and doing different things, go back to step three. Experience life together. Experience life. If I, work together. Do something together. 
And, and the same thing, if your finances are struggling, talk to God about your finances. Talk to God about your fears when it comes to your bills. Talk to God about the things that scare you and keep you up at night, and you will develop an attachment to him emotionally that will prepare you for whatever's going to come. You see, you could throw anything at me right now, and I will tell you that if you go back to step one and work your way through it with God about that topic, you will always come to the final step. A spiritual joy and peace and intimacy that cannot be explained with words. And so, how does the song go? Step, I'm not going to sing it. Step one. Come on, you sing, do this. Perfect. <laughs> One, you're like a dream come true. Two, I just want to be with you. Three, it is plain to see you are the only God for me. And four, if I ever forget this in my marriage, in my finances, in my relationship with my kids, in, in, in my job, with my friends, with my families, you know, I'm going to go back and start over a step one. And every single time I feel something slipping or I feel like something's not aligned, I go back to step one. God, you are like a dream come true. Can I tell you about what's happening in my life? Can I tell you how I'm struggling? Can I, can I share with you? Can you show me what I should do? And the more you talk, the more you get to step two, I just want to be with you. I just, I just want to spend time with you. This is not enough. 30 minutes on Sundays is not enough for me. I, I want to be with you, God. I want to be with you. I, I, I need more of you. And this will lead you into step three. I just want to experience life with you. I, I want to see everybody through you. That means the people that aggravate me, I want to see them through your eyes. I want to understand that, that people are broken and people are hurt and they respond at this brokenness. And it's not even about me. And God, just give me the eyes to see. And whenever I struggle, whenever I fall apart, whenever I forget, you know, I'll start back over at step one. Brian when Knight was a theologian and didn't even know it. If you are willing to see it, God is in everything. And so that's my, my, my encouragement for us today is this series as we start, all I want for Christmas is love. If I ask right now to give a show of hands and I said, who in here just wants love? Half of you would raise your hand, half of you wouldn't because you are convinced you don't need it. And it is a lie that you have believed to protect your heart from getting hurt again. Not only do you need love, you are designed to crave it. You are designed to experience an intimacy with a God who knows every detail about you, about a spouse who, who will love you through those things. And in the midst of it, we guide our children down these same paths. Amen? Amen? So I'm gonna ask. Norma, so close your eyes, raise your hand. No, I want everybody to look. Who just needs some love? I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I know it is not easy to, to say publicly. I just, I want, I want a hug. <laughs> I just want to be loved on. Because it makes you feel vulnerable. And what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Did, did God speak to you during this message? few of you watch it later on YouTube it'll hit you again I, 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 I prepared this message with all of you in mind that's how I do every single message with trying to understand as much as I humanly can what we're going through the holidays as much as we love Christmas right I mean just look at these trees look how fantastic they did decorating these trees and you look at it and it makes you feel happy right you feel like a joy but not everybody feels that way. 
right now, people who have lost somebody they love are looking at these trees and they're not seeing beauty, they're seeing absence. Because they always looked at the trees with the person next to them. You know, the, the holidays are always getting together and families are coming together and, and, and there's food and laughs and conversations. Somebody is experiencing life without those things right now. Maybe for the very first time. And so when I wrote this, this idea that all I want for Christmas is love. All I want for Christmas is intimacy. I wrote it with you in mind. That maybe it's not you today. Maybe, maybe you are overwhelmed with love. Maybe your spouse loves you so drastically and you have such an amazing relationship with God that your love is just like quenched daily. God bless you. But be aware that not everybody around you has the same thing that you have. And just because we're able to smile through the pain, and just because we're able to distract ourselves, doesn't mean that we all feel the same way. And so I, I want to encourage you, as we go through this series and as we, we go through these different topics.